Good evening and welcome back, those of you that have come back, and uh, those of you that are for the first time, welcome for the first time. I think it's still not too late to get into it, because you only missed one presentation, and uh, we will do a short, a very short review of uh, what we did last time, last week. If you're ready, then we can pray and uh, go to it. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for a new chapter, a new section of the book of Revelation that you want to open in front of us. May your spirit guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. For those that missed the first presentation, please know that uh, the first presentation is now on YouTube, so you can watch it, which I believe uh, makes it easier for those that cannot possibly attend every single time. But I can promise if you are here and you follow through the process, it's going to be much better for you. We are not doing this study in a very minute detailed way. For a minute detailed study of the book of Revelation, we would need a year or two or more. What we are focusing on is the story of the book of Revelation. When you do a minute detailed study of the book of Revelation, the risk is you get lost in details and you miss the story. Now, once the story is clear in your head, then you can go to many details, because then every single detail can bring new light to what you have seen already. You probably remember from last time that we looked at the section of the story that is here, right? Because the construction of the book of Revelation is a chiastic structure in which the first section, the section of the seven churches, is paralleled in the seventh section. You remember that from last time. And it builds like a mountain. The second section is paralleled by what section? Six. Yes, third section by fifth, and you have right on top section number four. And you may think, what is that yellow triangle and then a green triangle on top of it? Well, that's an exciting thing when we get there. But now we are in section two. Please remember that last time we've seen how history is being told, the story of Christianity from Jesus' first coming on earth to the second coming in the shape of seven segments, seven historical segments. And that is the seven churches. That's how it appears in chapters 2 and 3. So I'm going to lay down these seven sections again. Ephesus, Smyrna, what's next? Pergamon, Thyatira, and then Sardis, okay, and then Philadelphia, and then Good job, good job. Okay. So, according to what we see last time, Ephesus starts right in the first century, right after Jesus' uh, first coming, which involves also his death, resurrection, and ascension. And it ends with Laodicea, 
which is the last segment of history, of the history of Christianity. And uh, you remember that somewhere here in the middle, the message of the second coming popped up. Until I come, I will come as a thief. I am coming quickly, and I'm at the door knocking. Okay, so that progression of uh, the second, second coming's urgency is a potent evidence that something is being built here, chronologically leading up to the end. Now, tonight we are here in the second section, right here, the seven seals. And obviously the seven seals parallel the seven churches. So we have seven churches, seven seals, seven what? Trumpets. All three of those layers practically present the same history, but from different angles, with different focuses. So looking at the seven seals, we also want to know the introductory vision, because remember, every single section of the seven has an introductory vision that has to do with what? With the sanctuary service. Do you remember where Jesus was when John first saw him? Among? Among the seven candlesticks. And the candlesticks, where are they? in the holy place, in the sanctuary, right? So that is the first introductory vision. So that was Jesus among the candlesticks. The question is, what kind of event was described in that first introductory vision? Jesus says in Revelation 1.18, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forever. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Question. From among the Jewish festivals, what festival is hinted upon here? What festival from the Jewish festivals has to do with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Which one? Passover. Passover. Yes. So it's not only the sanctuary that is hinted, but also the first Jewish festival, which is Passover. Keep that in mind, please, because that's going to bring light to the next section. And uh, as you remember, probably from reading through the seven messages, in each message you have this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's like a reminder, hey, you have to listen carefully because there is something deeper being told here than just the words and the symbols that you are hearing. Okay. This was the final verse that we looked at last time. Revelation 3.21, you remember that every single message to the seven churches has a final promise to the overcomer. Have you noticed that? Every message out of the seven has he who overcomes, he who overcomes, he who overcomes. The message to Laodicea contains this promise from God to the overcomer in this section of history, the final section of history. What is the promise? To him who overcomes, and the verb there is nikau in Greek. There is a shoe, a brand, a shoe brand that comes from that verb. Nike. And Nick. Nicholas, Monique, Veronica, all those Nick, Nika 
have to do with the concept of victory. Because in Greek, nikao means to be victorious, to overcome. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, says Jesus, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Please notice the four historical events presented here. What is the first historical event? Who overcomes first? Jesus overcame, right? Then what, what was next? He sat down, okay, so there's the second event. What's the third event? You overcome, okay, and what's the fourth event? You sit down. Can you see the chronology? So in this one promise, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, you practically have Jesus being victorious, then sitting on the throne, you being victorious, and then you sitting on the throne. Four consecutive chronological events. Now, you may think, why is this important? Because this verse, 321, is something that they call a springboard passage. Do you know what a springboard is? What is a springboard? A springboard is something that you run toward, you jump on it, and what does the springboard do? It projects you where? Forward, right? Okay. That's exactly how this verse here functions. And in the book of Revelation, we have several springboard passages. Why? Because in this springboard passage, you have Jesus becoming victorious. The next step is sitting on the throne, him sitting on the throne, then you being victorious and you sitting on the throne. It's like you jumped on a springboard and one, two, three, four, you are projected forward. Why is it important? Because the next four chapters, chapter four, five, six, and seven, are practically descriptions of those four historical events. What was the first historical event? Jesus overcomes, okay? Revelation chapter 4 is about Jesus overcoming. And how do I know? Because Revelation chapter 4 is a heavenly scene. John is in heaven, in vision. But Jesus is not in heaven. Jesus does not appear in chapter 4. Why, you may think? Well, because he did not overcome in heaven. He overcame where? On earth. But in chapter 5 is the next historical event. Because he overcame, then he did what? He sat on the throne. And in chapter 5, Jesus is in front of the throne. Like coming from planet Earth after he became victorious, and now he's ready to sit on the throne in chapter 5. Chapter 6. What is the third historical event in the springboard passage? We are overcoming. We overcome. And in chapter 6, indeed, God's people, you and I, go through a process. It's like a war. But at the end of it, we overcome. And in Revelation chapter 7, God's people is standing before the throne. And what do they do after they overcome? They sit on the throne. So have you seen the process? One single verse 
that springboard passage in 321, opens up the four historical events that are described in these four chapters. And these four chapters, chapters 4, 5, 6, and 7, describe the experience of God's people in their way toward victory. Just the way Jesus overcame and sat on the throne, we overcome and sit on the throne. That's the short version of the story. Now, let's go to it and see how it plays out. Okay? Remember in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, Jesus tells John, Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The seven churches describe things that are at that time and will take place because it's a double application. Seven historical churches from that time that outline the history of Christianity from that time to the end of the times. But when we come to chapter 4, something changes. Listen carefully, watch carefully, and you tell me what changes. After these things, says John, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things. What things? which must take place after this. That is, all future. So this section here, from chapter 4 on, doesn't have a present application as well, like in the case of the churches. Everything is future. Those are things that have to take place after those things. Okay? Let's see what is happening there. Immediately, says John, I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one set on the throne. Who's on the throne? Uh-uh. God the Father. God the Father. How do we know? Well, we will see in the text. All right? So, as I mentioned earlier, and you can read chapter 4 from the beginning to the end, it's a beautiful description, you will never find Jesus in chapter 4, and some other heavenly being are also missing. Anybody knows who's missing there? The angels are missing. The angels are not mentioned at all in chapter 4. They appear, however, in chapter 5. Verse 4 says in Revelation uh, chapter 4, around the throne were 24 thrones. What for? Ah, and on the throne I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Can you have the picture of the throne in the middle and 24 thrones with 24 elders on the thrones? Remember, Jesus is not in heaven. He doesn't appear in chapter 4. And the angels don't appear. Nevertheless, the four living creatures and the 24 elders do appear. I know, the first question is now, who are the 24 elders? Well, we are getting there. Follow the story. Please notice for now that the 24 elders are in heaven when Jesus is not in heaven, but he is obtaining victory on earth. The angels are not there either. Have you noticed in the gospel that when Jesus dies and is resurrected, there's all kind of angelic appearing all over the place in the Garden of Gethsemane? at the tomb, on the day of resurrection, 
at his ascension, angels all over the place. You wonder why? Well, because the angels are involved in the whole story of Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. But watch. I'm not going to go into details here in chapter 4. You can read it, but let's move on with the story. In chapter 5, after we've seen chapter 4 where Jesus is not present, he doesn't appear, the angels are not there either. John says, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, who's sitting on the throne? God the Father. I saw in his right hand what? A scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Now, I don't have a scroll with seven seals. I have a small scroll just to give an idea of what a scroll looks like. You know how uh, you open a scroll, you roll it out. But it has seven seals, seven seals. So suppose instead of one seal on this thread, you have seven. You have three, four, five, six, seven. Okay? Question. When can the book be open? After I tear off the first seal, can the book open? Uh-uh. When can it open? After all seven are broken. If it's bound and the seals are on it, then only after all seven are broken, then you can open it. Good. Now, John says he sees the one sitting on the throne, a scroll in his hand, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel, he says, proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to lose its seals? Now, question, what symbolizes, what does the scroll symbolize? The one sitting on the throne is the king, the king of the universe, God himself, God the Father. What is the symbol of the scroll in his head? Did you know in the Old Testament, when a king was enthroned, placed on, set on the throne. He received a book, among other things. He received a crown as well, a book, a scepter. But there was a book. What is the book about? No, it's the book of the covenant or of the law. What is it for? Based on the, it's like the constitution. Based on that book, the king ruled the people. It was an insignia, a symbol, a token of royalty, of kingly authority. So, God the Father is sitting on the throne. He would like to hand this scroll, the sign of kingship, to somebody, but nobody can take it. And what's John's reaction? He says, And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much, he says, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. Now remember that John, John the Apostle, did some Bible classes with Jesus. Do you know when? There is a, a section of their life when the Bible says specifically that they did Bible study and went through the Old Testament. When? After his death and resurrection. Look at the last chapter in the Gospel of Luke. And you will see how it's described there that Jesus went through the, the Old Testament explaining to them how all those things were actually speaking about whom? about him. So when John sees the book, he understands the symbol. He knows God wants to give the book to the Son. The king 
of Judah, because Jesus Christ is a descendant of Judah, of David. And John knows that Jesus Christ has died, was resurrected, went back to the Father, but when he sees this whole scenery of the Father wanting to give the book to somebody, nobody's there. And he starts crying. One translation says, and I wept and wept. Because he says, oh, so the whole thing failed with Jesus? He's not worthy to take the scroll? Where is Jesus in, whole, in, in this whole picture? Well, somebody comes to him, one of the elders, and uh, says, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed or has overcome, the same Nikau, to open the scroll and to lose its seven seals. So Jesus appears. But again, he just hears one of the elders say, Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. Does he see the lion? What does he see? And I looked, he says, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood what? Also the lion and the lamb is the same. But the lamb, as though it had been slain. What festival is that when he was slain? What? Passover. Passover. But let me ask you, what festival speaks about the lion, not the lamb? Because the lamb and the lion are two consecutive realities of Jesus' activity. Jesus first is the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. Lamb as though it was, or it had been slain. Is the lamb slain here? Uh-uh, no, but something reminds of the fact that he had been slain. At this point, he is not slain anymore. At this point, he is what? He's the lion. What festival is that? What is the next festival after Passover? Hmm? Pentecost. Exactly. But how do you know? Well, look in the text. Stood the lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. When were the seven spirits, the Holy Spirit, sent out into all the earth? When? On the day of Pentecost. So the introductory vision here is the day of Pentecost, which actually ratifies the sacrifice of Jesus Christ at Passover. In other words, without Passover or without the Lamb, there is no Pentecost or there is no Lion. Because the victory of the Lamb makes it possible for the Lion to take the scroll. Because what makes him worthy to take the scroll? What? He is let's see. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne, and they, meaning the four living creatures and the 24 elders, sang a new song. I'm using the NIV here for a reason. There's a little mistranslation in the NKJ. This is what they are singing. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal because... So what is the reason? Why is he worthy? Because you were slain when? At Passover, correct? And with your blood, you purchase for God persons, or some translations have it, people from every tribe and language and people and nation. 
The difference in the NKJ is that the four living creatures and the 24 elders say, because you were slain and with your blood you purchased us, as if Jesus had purchased them, the 24 elders and the four living creatures. But that's not the case. Now remember, in chapter 4, the 24 elders were present, right? The angels and Jesus were not. So then, who are the 24 elders? Well, most likely, and I have biblical evidence for that, the 24 elders are representatives of unfallen worlds. How do I know they cannot be humans rescued from planet Earth? Simple. Because when Jesus died and was resurrected, some others were resurrected as well to be taken as a trophy, as a token of his victory over sin and death, and they were taken to heaven. We have plenty of biblical evidence for that. But the 24 elders had been there already. So then they cannot be that group of people that were resurrected at the resurrection of Jesus Christ and taken to heaven. We may want to come back to it in the conversation, in the discussion uh, part. But let's go with the flow of the story now. So then, when Jesus takes the scroll, the 24 elders and the four living creatures say, you are worthy, and then the angels as well. So now in chapter 5, the angels are present. Why? Because they came back, they escorted Jesus twice back to heaven after his death and resurrection. Worthy is the Lamb who, has, who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And I'm jumping straight into chapter 6. Look what happens in chapter 6. Now, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come! In your translation, it may say, come and see. Because some translators have understood that the come is for John to come and see what is going to happen. But the word in uh, Greek is erhu, which means come. And it doesn't refer to John to come and see. It refers to what comes. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. That's what comes. So the voice said, come. See? And the first horse, which is the white horse, comes. He who sat on it had a bow, and the crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Or in some other translations, you have the NIV in your worksheet, as a conqueror and to conquer. Do you get what is this? What this is? Well, Jesus, when he goes out to conquer, he had conquered already at the cross. Remember, chapter 4, he overcomes. Chapter 5, he sits on the throne. So he is already victorious. That's why he goes out conquering, or as a conqueror. That's a better translation. As a conqueror. He is already a conqueror. And yet he goes out again, because now in chapter 6, it is you conquering. And in chapter 7, it is you sitting on the throne. But you cannot conquer, you cannot sit on the throne unless the conqueror, Jesus Christ, goes out to conquer again. This is what in theology is called already and not yet. Already, but not yet. 
He already conquered. He is a conqueror already, and yet he has to go out again to conquer because your victory and my victory, your sitting on the throne and my sitting on the throne depends totally on his conquering. Okay, so he goes out conquering or as a conqueror and to conquer. And then the second horse, another horse. So again, the call or the voice says, come. And another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. When he opened the third seal, so now the third horse is going to come, I looked and behold a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And then when he opened the fourth seal, I looked and behold a pale horse and the name of him who sat on it was Death and Hades followed with him. This is like a horse drawing a hearse. The picture is somewhat like this. But please notice something. When the first horse goes out right here, it's only that first horse running. The text doesn't say that when the second horse goes out, the first horse stops running. Are you following? Then, when the third horse appears, the text doesn't say that the first and the second horse had stopped running. Are you following? Okay, when the fourth horse goes out, the text doesn't say that the previous three horses had stopped running. So now my question is, at this point here, at the next seal, at the fifth seal, say, how many horses are running? Huh? Very interesting. All four horses are running side by side. But did you know that in the book of Revelation, in the end, meaning right here, only one of the horses come out? Which one? Where is the red, where is the black, and where is the pale? They're gone. Because this is a very vivid and warlike presentation of what has happened and is happening throughout the history of Christianity. Christianity started with Christ riding the white horse as a conqueror bent on conquest or to conquer. But then the red horse appears as a symbol of persecution. And yes, Christianity had to deal with persecution throughout the centuries. And then the dark black horse comes out. And yes, Christianity had to deal with darkness. And then the pale horse comes out, which is a symbol for death. And yes, Christianity has to deal with that as well. But after the four seals, the first four seals, those four realities are running side by side. That's why the history of Christianity is so complex and complicated. Because it would be so beautiful to only see the white horse running. A horse in the Bible is always war-related, when it's symbolic in meaning. It has to do with some sort of war. When you look at the history of Christianity, especially from, say, the middle section of the history of Christianity, you see all those four realities running side by side. And it's very confusing. Because you may ask at one point, okay, which horse is the right horse? I want to bet on the right horse. Which horse is the right horse? 
The problem is Christianity, by and large, most of the time, picked the wrong horse. You know, in my childhood, there was a story about some kids, some young people from the village that would go out to the pasture where some people would keep their horses and ride them during the night. So what would happen is, during the day, people would use horses for labor, farming. During the night, they would take them out, tie them so they cannot run away, and leave them there so that throughout the night they can eat, and in the morning they would go and pick them and go back to farming. But some uh, young people that have no, had no horses, they said, okay, let's have some fun. And they would go out and uh, ride those horses throughout the night. And all was fine until one of the guys picked the wrong horse. And that's how it came out. It was very weird because the people were kind of surprised to see that in the morning some of the horses were tired. Tired and their belly was empty. What happened? Well, <laughs> the point is, somebody told me there's no wrong horse, there's wrong pick. Now, for us here to, to, to understand the story, Christianity picked the wrong horse quite many times. Instead of the white horse riding toward victory, the horse that will come out victorious at the end, they picked the horse of persecution. Did Christians persecute? Big time. Probably the fiercest persecution. Did Christianity darken life? Yes. They hid the Bible instead of putting out light there to be seen by people. Did Christianity bring about death? Of course. And to, to make it even more vivid, the fifth seal brings exactly, see, that's the horse, the white horse coming out victorious. So you have four, but somewhere, somehow, Maybe in the Battle of Armageddon, the three other horses perish. We are dealing with symbolic realities here, but I'm just giving out some hints, because at one point, those three horses disappear, but the white horse and the rider comes at the end. But the fifth seal, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And here, many commentators are puzzled and say, they say, How, how are those... Uh, souls under the altar crying out. What is this about? Well, it's a symbol. It's a code. Just like in the book of Genesis, chapter 4, God tells Cain, you remember what, what God told Cain? The blood of your brother is crying up. Did the blood cry? Can a blood cry? You know, in the Bible, blood and soul are synonymous. There are Bible verses for that. No, the soul cannot cry, but this is a symbol to say that it has been too much already. And they want divine justice to get involved. And then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer. So it's not over yet. God tells them, hey, I am going to intervene. I am going to do justice. But 
little longer. Rest a little longer. I looked when he opened the sixth seal. And see, we are advancing. We are here already. And behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Question? What are these? Signs. What signs? Signs leading up to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You find them in some other places. At least some of them. And it is somehow parallel to Matthew as well. But again, we don't want to get stuck here because we are still following the story. But it's obvious that as we are coming closer and closer to the end, the signs pop up. But something weird is presented here. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. Why? And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath or indignation of the Lamb. Huh, the Lamb can be angry? Is there such thing as the wrath of the Lamb? Have you ever seen a Lamb being angry? Just ponder the question. Well, when I was a child, I got an encounter with an angry Ram. I know how it is. So if uh, Jesus Christ is a Ram lamb, because you know on the Mount of Moriah it was a ram in the thicket, so then you can imagine the lamb being angry, having that wrath or indignation. Now this is not a whimsical kind of, uh, I'm going to be mad now and I'm going to... No, this is some sort of manifestation of justice. The Lamb did not change his character. And is not going to change, his character is not going to change at the end either. And the Lamb will come back. So that's why I need you to, to get in the picture of the wrath of the Lamb, because it's coming back again. Yes, it is a manifestation of judgment. Not as in judgmental, but as in divine justice, where people have to face what they did, right? For the great day of his wrath, that is a day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? What is the answer to that question? Who is able to stand in front of the wrath of the Lamb? What is, what is the human, the natural, honest human answer to that? No one. No one is able to stand. And yet, there are some that can stand. Who? And here we hit chapter 7, which is practically sort of a parenthesis between the 6th and the 7th seal. So here we are at the end of the sixth seal. We have one more seal, which will be the first verse in chapter 8. But here we have this parenthesis that functions as an answer to this question, who is able to stand? Who is able to stand? Well, after these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. 
the picture is, is very uh, suggestive because it's like four angels holding the, the winds so that the winds will not blow, so that catastrophe and, and, and all that comes with the blowing of the wind will not start yet. It's like holding everything back. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. Oh. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So who is able to stand? The servants of God that are sealed on their forehead. Whatever the seal means, because we are not going into details right now, but you get the picture. The question was asked, who is able to stand? The answer is, well, these are able to stand. The servants of our God that are sealed by that angel on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And then you have a very interesting description of the 12 tribes. And there are some specifics of uh, the 12 tribes because some are missed. Some that are not really sons of Jacob appear. So, what is this about? Well, before explaining what this is, I want to bring to your attention a phenomenon that we have already seen. In chapter 1, Jesus hears the sound that is like the sound of a trumpet. Remember? What does he do? He looks and he sees what? Jesus among the lampstands, among the candlesticks. So first he hears, then he looks. Okay. In chapter five, 5, the lion from the tribe of Judah, John hears one of the elders saying, he is worthy. The lion from the tribe of Judah. What does he do? He looks. John looks and sees what? The lamb. Is it the same? Well, yes and no. But if you take the whole picture, it's the same reality. Just like the voice or the sound of a trumpet was Jesus speaking, and when he looked, he saw Jesus. Here, the speaking is about uh, the lion from the tribe of Judah. When he looks, he sees the lamb. Same reality, in different manifestation. Later on in chapter 17, Somebody tells John, uh, come, let me show you the prostitute that sits on many waters. And he looks, and he sees a woman on a beast. Is it the same thing? Yes, it is, but different manifestations, different moments. In chapter 21, somebody tells him, come, let me show you the bride of the Lamb. And he looks, and he sees New Jerusalem. Is it the same? It is. Same reality, different manifestations at different moments. So please get the phenomenon. He hears something, then he looks and sees something. What does he see? The same thing that he heard, but in a different kind of manifestation. Did you get that? Okay, now. When John first tells us about the 144,000, does he hear about them or does he see them? And I heard, did he see them? No? No, he heard them. Heard the number. The number of those who were sealed, 144,000. So, what's next then? Ah, he will see them. Okay, look, verse 9. 
And after these things, I, what? Looked. And behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. So then let me ask you, the, four, the 144,000 and the great multitude that he sees here, is it the same or not? Yes. It is the same, different manifestations at different points. Why? This is why. Crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? Where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation, and washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, so when he hears about the 144,000, they are before the great tribulation. When he sees the great multitude scattered so that nobody can count them, that doesn't mean God doesn't know that number, for sure. But this is, this is a picture like the one that you probably saw in movies. You see an army lined up, and there's a description of the 144,000 units of thousands, like the army of Israel. Israel is God's warrior and God's conqueror. That's the two meanings in Hebrew. So Israel, God's people, is lined up for the battle. Now when they come out of the battle, do they look the same way? as when they go into the battle? What's the difference? When you come out of the battle, you're scattered. You're all over the place. You are not lined up like when you entered. Because the great tribulation is not an easy experience. So when they are coming out of the tribulation, same group, same 144,000, whoever they are, and we know who they are because they are those that washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So we know who they are, really. They come out, but they come out in a way that nobody can count, really. Yes, God knows their number, but humanly speaking, it's impossible to count, right? So that's the picture here. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night, in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. Remember the lamb, the furious, angry lamb, the, the wrath of the lamb? For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. So he didn't change his character. He's the same lamb. He will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And now we are hitting the seventh seal. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And you may think, what is that about? Why is it silence in heaven? Somebody tried to explain it to me once, and he said, I have potent evidence women will not get to heaven <laughs> because there will be half an hour of silence there. <laughs> that's not the meaning. That's a, that's a bad joke. <laughs> the meaning is the meaning is that the angels when Jesus comes back the angels follow him. So the praise songs that usually are heard in heaven will come closer to planet Earth at that point, right? So that's how the whole story of uh, the seven seals play out. 
Let me ask you if that is not fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. Because now you can see how these two indeed are parallel. They start from the same moment with different backgrounds. Here the start is the Passover festival. Over here the start is what? Pentecost. Both start in the sanctuary. Here Jesus is among the candlesticks. Over here Jesus is in front of the throne as a lion that is the lamb that looks like it was slain because there's something in the lamb that indicates he was slain and just for your wider perspective you know that Ellen White says that there will be some signs on Jesus's uh, hands that will stay for eternity reminding of the fact that he was slain he was slain, right? So the story is reinforced. And remember the springboard passage? Christ is victorious, and then he sits on the throne. You become victorious, and then you sit on the throne. That's the story of the seven seals. Five minute break, and then back to Q&A. Good question. We have 24 elders. Should we conclude that there are 24 unfallen worlds? Of course, assuming that what I said, that the 24 elders are indeed representatives of the unfallen worlds. Does that mean that there are 24 unfallen worlds somewhere in this universe? Well, the answer to that is we don't know. <laughs> what we know is that in the Old Testament there is a correspondence between the 24 courses or orders of priests and the 24 elders. That is pretty obvious. Why? Because if Jesus Christ is the high priest, and I think we can agree on that, that Jesus Christ is the high priest, then the way the 24 courses of priests are distributed, it's almost the same picture that we can see in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. The 24 elders, the 24 courses of priests, and the high priest, Jesus Christ, in the middle. So that gives us some uh, pretty solid ground to believe that, yes, there is a clear correspondence between the Old Testament sanctuary service, which serves like a sandbox for the big plan of salvation, and what we see in the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ, the high priest, and the 24 elders, the number value of them, I would not venture say anything, whether it's to be taken 24 or it's a representation of something. That's a good question. So the question is, could the 24 elders be a representation of 12 plus 12, meaning 12 tribes in the Old Testament, the sons of Jacob, and then 12 apostles in the New Testament. So 12 plus 12, 24. Well, mathematically, yes. But that means to miss everything we explained tonight. So what we were trying to explain is that in chapter 4, Jesus Christ and the angels are not present in heaven. Jesus Christ is on earth winning, overcoming, obtaining victory. The angels as well are on planet earth somehow waiting for the moment when they can escort Jesus Christ back to the throne. 
But in, 20, in chapter 4, the 24 elders are already there. Jesus comes back to heaven only in chapter 5, and he is introduced as the Lion of Judah, which is actually the lamb that looks like it was slain. If that's the moment when Jesus comes back to heaven, to the throne, then it is the same moment when he is escorted by the angels who are missing in chapter 4, and now they are back in chapter 5. You can check that. Plus, he's also escorted by some human beings that are resurrected when Jesus Christ is resurrected. Since the 24 elders are already there before these people come with Jesus, the 24 elders cannot be representatives of Old Testament and New Testament people. Because they are already there when Jesus is winning on earth and the angels are escorting him back. The 24 elders are there. And when they praise God, this is what they say in chapter 5, verse 9. And they, that is the four living creatures and the 24 elders who have been there in chapter 4, they say, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God people or persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. The 24 elders are not among them. The 24 elders praise Jesus Christ because he indeed saved people from among humans. Uh, as a recommendation, Desire of Ages, the last chapter. Read it carefully, and you will see that Ellen White describes in details exactly the same scenario. Very good question. Was Adam the elder of this church before the fall? And the answer is based on this scenario, yes. I would even risk that Adam and Eve together were that elder. So what is happening here, if I'm reading it correctly in the context of uh, the whole story and of the Bible, Jesus Christ becomes worthy in the sense that he obtains victory back that was lost by Adam and Eve in the beginning. So he wins power back over planet Earth. And based on the same principle of already but not yet, Jesus is holding a place for Adam until this moment here, when the final victory will be clear in front of the whole universe. Because Adam and Eve at this point are not there yet. They are waiting resurrection for resurrection. But Jesus Christ has won the victory over earth because the conversation here is not Jesus Christ winning in any kind of uh, larger sense than planet earth. His authority was not challenged with regard to some other places. His authority was challenged with regard to this specific place. So Jesus Christ wins back planet Earth and holds the place for Adam and Eve until the moment when everything can be restored and the new Earth or the redone Earth can be given back to humanity. Great question. Yeah. Good question. So who are the 144,000? Are they the believers that are alive at the coming of Jesus Christ. Based on Revelation chapter 7, I would say yes. I know that there is also a different kind of interpretation which makes that group stand for everybody 
saved at any time in the history of humanity. I tend to believe, because of the chronological order in which it is placed between the sixth and the seventh seal, that they indeed represent uh, a special segment of humanity that will be sealed before the final um, tribulation, because that's the word used there, and uh, they will be victorious and uh, come out victorious from that final clash, if I may say so. Excellent question. What are the seven horns? Let me bring the verse back. The lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth? Now, the question is, the seven spirits are the seven eyes or the seven horns plus the seven eyes? The question is, what do the seven horns and the seven eyes represent? First of all, horn in the Bible is authority, it's power. And there are many Bible verses that prove that. Let me just bring one example that you are all familiar with. Do you remember the ram in the thicket? What was the body part that was cut actually in the thicket? The horn. What does that say? Because the most powerful, the strongest part of a ram's body is exactly this part. And yet, that's the part where the, whereby the ram is caught in the thicket. Meaning, the Almighty, that's the seven, all, horde power, the Almighty becomes powerless, makes himself powerless, and allows to become a sacrifice. Because had he not allowed them to kill him, they would have never been able to kill him. Jesus was not killed, or let me rephrase it, Jesus was not merely killed. Jesus allowed himself to be killed, therefore he is a sacrifice, not a victim. And that's two different things. When you have a sacrifice, that's somebody that gives himself. When you have a victim, it's somebody that cannot do anything against it. Okay, so that's about the horn, the power. Eyes, you have another characteristic of God and of Jesus Christ and of the Holy Spirit as well. You have almighty, right, or omnipotence, and you have omniscience, or all knowledge. He knows everything. He penetrates everything. It's not only all knowledge. I coined a term that I use sometimes. It's all for knowledge, which is much more than just knowledge, because knowledge in a conventional uh, sense is to know everything at a given point. His kind of knowledge, his kind of seven eyes, a symbolic representation of that penetration is much more than that because he does not only know everything at a given point in his story, he knows everything at any point in history, even things that have not happened yet, which is all for knowledge. So, what we see here is a sort of correspondence between the Lamb Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, because it's exactly the moment about which Jesus was speaking before he went back to the Father. I'm going to the Father and I'm going to send from him the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one that carries on the work of the Lamb on the earth. And that's why it says the seven spirits of God sent out in all the earth. It's the all-pervasive presence of the Holy Spirit, which is the powerful manifestation of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Thank you. Very good question. 
the 144,000 are the Israelites biologically, are they biological descendants of Jacob? Are they exclusively the Jews or the descendants of the Jews, the 12 tribes of Jacob? Now, first of all, if you analyze a little bit the names that appear in that list, you will see that there, is, there are some differences between the normal lists that you find in the Old Testament and those names that appear in this list. I will not go into detail, but I will try to show something from chapter 7 that clearly says, clearly indicates that they are not limited to an ethnic Israelite group. That is, Chapter 7, verse 4, and I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So, children of Israel. Based on this, you could bet it's only them. But if what I was explaining with this, I heard, and then I saw, principle, if that is correct, and I believe there is potent evidence in the book of Revelation that that is the correct way of looking at this scenario, then those 144,000 and those that John sees here, because he first hears their number, then he looks and he sees a great multitude which no one could number. Now read. Of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. So then I'm asking, are they limited to Israel? No. So it is much wider than that. It includes all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, including the biological descendants of Israel. That's a very interesting... Let me repeat for the camera. There's this theory that the 12 tribes of Israel were scattered in the entire world exactly for this, so that they bring in these all nations, tribes, people, and tongues. Is that correct or not? I cannot say yes or no. It makes some sense, and then it makes no sense in some other ways. But it's a very interesting insight, and I would go and further study it. Because I believe it's not by haphazard that God did or allowed to happen to Israel, the historic Israel, what happened to them. Is the 144,000 symbolic? Now, if what we have explained up to this point is true, then it is symbolic in the sense that the 144,000 Israelites are not limited to ethnic Israelites, but they are Israel in the sense that the New Testament uses the word Israel. And in the New Testament, the word Israel is used in a much wider sense first, Everybody that believes becomes Abraham's descendants, one. And second, the Apostle Paul says that there was this uh, olive tree, the noble olive tree. Some of the branches fell away. And then in that olive tree, some branches from the wild olive tree were grafted in. And that together is Israel. So, that's what we are talking about here. But now your question is this. The number itself, mathematically, is it 144,000, period, no more, no less? And it would be easy to say something, but again, my honest answer is, I don't know. No matter if the numeric 
value of the 144,000 is the exact mathematical value that that number indicates, the way I interpret it still stands. Because whether it's 144,000 period or a much bigger number represented by the 144,000, if they enter into the battle and then they come out and that's when you look, they look like a multitude that nobody can count except for God. So 144,000, if you just make a, an effort to imagine 144,000 soldiers march in, marching into a battle, when they come out, they are a great multitude that cannot be numbered. Now, if they stand for a much greater number, the interpretation still stands. But my honest answer is, I don't know. Yes. The great multitude, in my interpretation, is the same group at different points in time. Once before and then after the great tribulation. Well, it's not called... It's not, a, it's not called a great multitude. The question is very good. So the question is, why is it then called a great multitude if it's the same as the 144,000? Well, it's not called a great multitude. It's called a great multitude which no one could number, which is different. And I explained that there is this logic in the book of Revelation when you first hear something and then you look and you see the same thing that you heard but in a different manifestation or at a different stage. Such as, first, in chapter 1, the sound of the trumpet is what John hears. Then he looks and he sees Jesus Christ. Is Jesus Christ the same as the sound of the trumpet? Yes, it's his sound, but it's a different manifestation. Then in chapter 5, somebody speaks about the lion of the tribe of Judah. He looks, does he see the lion? He sees the lamb. But is the lamb the same as the lion? Yes, but a different manifestation. The lamb is on the day of uh, Passover. The Lion is on the day of Pentecost, correct? Based on the same kind of uh, interpretation, John first hears the 144,000, the number, then he looks, after these things I looked, and I saw, or, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number. And I explained why no one could number. It's because if you had them lined up for a battle, first, and then you see them as they come out from the great tribulation, when they come out from the great tribulation, they don't see, they don't look like an army going into battle, they look like a great multitude that nobody can number or count. Absolutely, absolutely. The focus is and uh, washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And that takes care of it. Whoever you are and whatever group one or the other is. Right? Yeah. Okay, I think um, we should wrap it up. It's late, but great questions, great questions. And uh, you will see next time it gets really tricky. Lord, I just want to place everybody in your care. I know whenever something sounds different, we may have even more questions, but we are here to learn, Lord, and may each one of us stay faithful to what you are saying and base our arguments on your word. In Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit, amen.